Putin has been a vital pillar of counterterrorism strategies across the globe. Yet despite nearly 20 years of preventative initiatives, this issue continues to be highly misunderstood, contested and politicized. To help address this, RUSI has completed an ambitious and comprehensive literature review, which entailed a detailed analysis of the evidence base and mapping of over 1,500 projects delivered by around 900 organizations in 100 countries. I'm delighted that we have a fantastic panel of speakers today. We are joined by four speakers, Emily Winterbotham, Eric Rosen, Jessica White, and Dr. Elizabeth Pearson. I will briefly introduce each of our presenters who will speak for five minutes. There will then be a chance for your questions, so please use the Q&A function. Before I hand over to our first speaker, Emily Winterbotham, I'd like to offer some opening remarks. The issue of radicalization and how we prevent violent extremism is, as you know, a complex issue. There are multiple factors at play, and we have tended to analyze these issues through a narrow lens, or we may have a partial picture of all of the facts. This has often resulted in the lack of nuance and contextualization of important evidence. I think there is more we can do to ensure the proper inclusion of Muslim CVE practitioners in our academic research and policy development. In building a comprehensive evidence base, we need to improve the way we synthesize the lived experience of civil society PVE practitioners with academic research and intelligence. I think it's important to set the scene in clarifying the established understanding of radicalization before we get into the specifics of the RUSI research. There is no single pathway to radicalization. Three elements come together to create the conditions in which initial engagement may occur in the absence of protective factors. These elements are one, background factors, which means aspects of someone's history or situation that might make them vulnerable to involvement in terrorist activities. Two, initial influences, people, ideas or experiences that influence an individual towards a terrorist movement. And three, ideological opening. An individual needs to be open to accepting the extremist ideology. In the prevention of violent extremism, practitioners have recognized the importance of approaching each individual on a case-by-case -case basis and understanding that a comprehensive package of interventions may need to be deployed. This may mean addressing personal, psychological, ideological, political, social, and identity issues within a real life context. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Emily Winterbotham. Emily is director of the Terrorism and Conflict Group and senior research fellow at RUSI, focusing on extremism and radicalization countering violent extremism and peace building. She is also, along with Dr. Elizabeth Pearson and Dr. Catherine Brown, an author of the forthcoming book, Countering Violent Extremism, Making Gender Matter. Emily will set out the methodology for the prevention project. She will then speak about the key findings from the first paper and the implications for counterterrorism policy. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Sabine, um, and thank you to you all for joining today. Um, we all know that over the past two decades, we've seen an increase in preventing or countering violent extremism interventions. Um, and this is in large part due to the recognition that military and security focused operations by themselves do not end terrorist movements. And I think it's important throughout today's discussion to hold on to this message because there is increasing criticism and backlash in the field of PCVE. 
Um, people criticize it for lacking evaluation and therefore for having a poor evidence base. And as a result, we still struggle, including those of us that work in the field, to really identify what can work um, and what has not worked. And this is where Rusi's terrorism and conflict team has come in. We've tried to fill this evidence gap. For the past two years, and with the support of the Royal Norwegian Government, we've conducted a literature review aiming to interrogate the evidence base of different PCVE interventions. So I'm briefly going to introduce that research, and then I'm going to highlight, as Sabine says, some of the key points from the first publication, which asks what can work and what has not worked in women-centric PCVE initiatives. So the methodology. The findings from all the papers are based on a literature review which applies systematic techniques to evaluate and synthesize findings from around 500 publications. These are primarily public documents, including peer-reviewed publications, program evaluations, program documents, and gray literature. They were all in the English language, and we need to acknowledge that this is a gap. There is undoubtedly some really good research and evaluations out there um, in other languages. We also only focused on literature that explored PCVE specifically. We know that there's excellent data in other fields, uh, from the criminal field, from the conflict or peace building field, but we had to be pragmatic. We only had a certain amount of time and team members. Um, but we also wanted to acknowledge that there is a tendency in this field to assume that what can work in the criminal space will work in the PCVE field. Um, and we didn't want to replicate that assumption. We did look at all kinds of extremism. Uh, however, there was an inevitable dominance of programs which focused on tackling Islamist violent extremism in the literature. I also wish to kind of emphasize that it's inevitable that there is a load of really good work out there that is likely not included in this review. I do think this kind of review um, probably unfairly penalizes small civil society organizations, including women's groups who do not publish academic articles and might lack sophisticated monitoring and evaluation techniques. That said, uh, we do have some findings. So the first um, links back to the point I've just made, which is that public documentation that's available therefore relates to a limited number of well-known interventions. The visibility of these efforts inevitably means that these interventions are critiqued most frequently. And we need to emphasize that it is not an attempt to discredit these organizations or undermine their work. It's simply that these organizations are actually doing us the service of publishing findings. The finding um, actually is relevant to the whole review because overall the entire 500 plus publications focused on certain contexts and on certain programs. So for example, out of 538 publications reviewed, 208 were focused on Europe. And of these, 87 were from the UK, particularly exploring Prevent. And I think those figures uh, demonstrate that information about the same sets of programs uh, is often recycled and this limits learning. We need to therefore be cautious to avoid conflating contexts and to avoid drawing too strong conclusions from a restricted set of interventions. In particular, um, there was a stark lack of data on programs targeting women's radicalization. And this is despite the attention we've seen in recent years uh, to the radicalization of women in light of Daesh. Uh, women's vulnerability to radicalization still seems to be ignored, at least at the program level. And instead, narratives of women being peaceful and moderate are still imbued throughout the PCVE field. The third area is that uh, interventions based on presumptions of womanhood need more evidence from different contexts. Women are not necessarily always more present at home, uh, nor do they necessarily have inherent abilities to spot the signs of radicalization. These programs, however, do likely work in some contexts but it's not generalizable um, across the field. And we do need to be cautious about putting too much burden on ordinary women uh, in particular. The fourth area um, we identified was that it looked more effective to engage, engage women who already have an existing role in the public sphere. 
So there are tentative findings that programs that aim to disrupt traditional assumptions about male and female roles in the religious and the security spheres, for example, can be effective. Uh, so we looked at programs in Bangladesh, Indonesia, or Kenya, where there were some positive findings from building relations between women's groups with security actors, including uh, involving them in the development of national action plans. And there were also some interesting findings, though I couldn't find an independent evaluation of Morocco's program training women to become female preachers. So just to sum up some concluding thoughts, we do need more evidence, um, including why things are not working. And that relates also to work that I have also written myself in the past. You know, we need to be conscious when we're critiquing these areas that we're critiquing on the basis of evaluations themselves. We've been tough, I think, on the evidence that we've um, provided in this review. But the reality, which I think we need to really recognize, is that the funding provided to these organizations, many of them small civil society organizations, is often too small and too short to actually be able to demonstrate an impact in any case. And this is not the fault of civil society organizations, um, but if I dare say it, of donors. So more evidence is needed. This does not mean that efforts should be discontinued. And instead, uh, we should pay more attention to documenting lessons learned, including perhaps exploring a far more user-friendly approach to monitoring and evaluation in this field. And I will leave it there and hand back to you, Sabine. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. It's helpful that you've highlighted an important lesson of the last two decades that military and security focused operations in isolation do not end terrorist movements. I'd now like to introduce Eric Rosen in Washington. In addition to being a senior associate fellow at Brucey, Eric is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and the director of the prevention project entitled Organizing Against Violent Extremism. From 2010 to 2016, Eric was a senior counterterrorism and CVE official in the US State Department under President Obama. Eric, it'd be interesting to hear from yourself why the prevention project? How are you situating the Rusi led piece into the wider project? What do you think the findings mean for global PVE and the implications for policymakers? And how might COVID 19? impact global PVE. Thank you, Eric. Um, th thanks, Sabine, and uh, thanks, Emily, for uh, the wonderful research and the collaboration on the, on the project. Um, I think to take a step back, uh, I think it's important to remember sort of from where this project emanated, and it essentially grew out of a um, experience that I, I had during the, the White House CVE summit, where this was 2015, where we, with partners around the world, elevated this notion of a whole of society approach to preventing violent extremism to a very high political level. And as a result, um, many, many new actors all of a sudden found themselves either willingly or uh, um, uh, somewhat willingly at, at a large table to talk about um, issues around violent extremism and what they can do to prevent it. And when I left government, it occurred to me that while we did a great job of elevating this agenda politically, we were working uh, so quickly to try to do that, that the result was there were lots of stakeholders, some of which uh, you know, didn't necessarily know their role. There wasn't clear roles and responsibilities, division of labor, um, and there wasn't a clear focus. Uh, and importantly, there wasn't a clear evidence base necessarily for what should be done and what shouldn't be done. And this led to the, uh, the prevention project in the first phase of which was um, to try to identify ways to sustain this um, uh, whole of society approach that really emphasized bottom up versus top down uh, um, uh, measures to deal with the threat. And in that first year and a half, the partnership with RUSI grew and developed and the RUSI role there was to start uh, taking stock of the landscape of civil society projects. Um, we didn't quite know what we were gonna do with all that, uh, the, the, uh, that information, but we really wanted to try to take stock of what was going on um, and what the impressions were from civil society 
in regards to how governments were um, rolling out this PVE uh, agenda, uh, both globally, nationally, and of course, locally. And one of the not so surprising conclusions was that um, there was a real mismatch between the rhetoric around this whole society approach that governments were articulating and the actions they were taking to enable this approach to become real and sustainable. Uh, and so the report in 2016 highlighted some of these contradictions and offered some recommendations for, um, uh, for, for, for how to take it, uh, the agenda forward. Um, fast forward a couple of years later, and the second phase of the project was um, really about taking stock of some of the progress that had been made in the ensuing two years, but some of the lingering barriers that existed. And I think um, that report was uh, about 18 months ago and that Emily and I collaborated on. And it, a lot of the findings are still, still ring true in terms of the progress. We see a very active uh, United Nations, both normatively and programmatically around PVE. Um, the number of uh, national action plans around violent extremism that are being developed uh, is probably 35 to 40 now. Uh, the number of uh, P PVE initiatives and networks, often locally led, again, growing rapidly. Um, the increased awareness of uh, policymakers and practitioners that local actors, especially civil society groups, have, un have distinct comparative advantages when it comes to PVE. Um, and the growing body of contextualized and conflict sensitive research on the drivers of violent extremism. So we, with this increased understanding of, of, of what's driving violent extremism, the idea was that would help uh, in the design uh, and targeting of PVE projects. We also saw the rapid uh, increase in involvement of development institutions in major international development institutions from the UNDP to the World Bank to the OECD, all of which had been skittish about uh, in the past about getting involved in a field that they thought was uh, going to risk securitizing their traditional development work. Uh, that those fears had, had have largely been been overcome, uh, and we saw a, a dramatic increase in the number of multidisciplinary uh, initiatives involving not just law enforcement but uh, social workers, mental health professionals, youth counselors, teachers, etc. Um, often working collaboratively uh, to either prevent individuals from uh, uh, turning to violence uh, or uh, rehabilitating and reintegrating those that um, have, have already crossed the path. Uh, and then we saw an increase in funding levels uh, for PVE, although difficult to capture the amount because of some of the uh, vague uh, definitional and terminological issues that uh, uh, Rusi has identified, uh, there was, was a significant increase in, in funding. But of course, the barriers uh, also uh, remain, um, and the, re the report highlighted many of those, and some of those, uh, many of those persist today, if not um, have been uh, exacerbated. Um, I think fundamentally, there's this disconnect often between counterterrorism and, and preventing violent extremism, and too many governments don't see them as um, essentially a zero sum game. You can't uh, inter uh, enact repressive uh, counterterrorism measures and still uh, embrace a whole of society approach. Um, and I think too many governments still um, see PVE as a niche and not uh, directly, uh, needing to be directly aligned with, with uh, ca uh, counterterrorism. Um, I think there's still the prevailing challenge of, of uh, aligning the framing of this global PVE agenda with very, very local contextualized priorities of communities around the world and how when so much of uh, PVE policymaking and programming decisions is centralized in capitals, uh, limited to government officials at the national level. How do you ensure that these local priorities, these local um, needs um, are, are, are captured in national approaches? Um, and then uh, there was the issue of, there's a lack of a common baseline, frankly, for gathering data and assessing PVE implementation across a wide range of countries. Uh, Emily's um, work and Rusi's work has, is really focusing now on, on the programmatic piece of this uh, and understanding what works and what doesn't work from the programmatic context. But I think a key missing piece is the policy dimension. And we really haven't uh, drilled down enough on um, the policy successes and, 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 and limitations uh, and what works and what doesn't in terms of policymaking in, around PVE. 
And of course, we know one of the reasons why we haven't been able to, to drill down so much on that is because it's a very, very sensitive issue. The issues of governance, the issues of how governments treat their populations have been largely ignored in the PV conversations because they're frankly very difficult. And instead, the donors and the international community focuses on things that people can, uh, from across regions, from across, across uh, uh, political cultures can, can talk about, which is programs. And I think that will need to change over the long term if we want to uh, sustain this agenda and have it uh, maximize its impact. And finally, there's, a, there's frankly a lack of a, a platform for governments around the world to come together and talk frankly about the full dimensions of PVE. Again, you can have monitoring and evaluation discussions, you can have programming discussions, you can have discussions among around the issues of young people in CVE or uh, women in CVE, but you can't have a discussion more broadly about um, uh, PBE or CBE in a, in a country context, what's working, what's not working from the policy domain to the programmatic domain. So quickly, just two final points. One is what are the findings of uh, uh, Emily's work and the larger uh, Rusu led prevention project? Uh, what are the implications for policymakers? I think it's pretty straightforward for me, which is that it's gonna hopefully help us move beyond what has largely been assumption based feel good uh, PVE programming decisions. Uh, and that's not necessarily a, necessarily a criticism of the field, but it's simply a reflection of um, uh, because of the limited research that's out there and because of the political sensitivities out there that donors have tended to shift and focus on initiatives that uh, are welcomed by the host government and are easily measurable and um, sound right. And so this is one of the reasons why the emphasis, so much emphasis on counter narratives. This is one of the reasons why so much emphasis on the role of religious actors, because both of those really deflect away from the responsibility um, and the role of the national government itself in generating any of the grievances that uh, give rise to violent extremism. So I hope uh, uh, policymakers will take these findings seriously, and I hope it will result in more smartly spent money around PVE going forward. And this gets, leads me to my final point, which is uh, related to COVID-19 and PVE, and why these findings from RUSI are even more critical than ever uh, in a, a COVID-19 world. And that is resources for PVE are going to be diminished. PVE specific resources are gonna be, are already being diverted towards obvious um, uh, uh, needs around um, the COVID crisis. And I think it's, um, uh, incumbent upon those of us who are in the, this so-called field of PVE to be articulating how governments can both better spend or spend the, li the limited amounts of funds that will be available for PVE, uh, but secondly, to start shifting more towards PVE, less as its own line of work, but more as part of a larger effort to prevent violence and to build local community capacities in fragile and conflict-affected states and to move beyond the siloization of um, programmatic work across the peace, security, and development world. And I think it, at the end of the day, PVE is going to be sustainable, is going to be have more impact if it is better integrated into these other programs at a local level, other um, efforts at a local level that often more strongly resonate with the local community. Um, then it will be to continue to have PV as this niche issue that is constantly trying to prove itself as an independent issue, so independent field. So I would leave it with that, and thank you very much uh, to Rusi for all this great work and to Sabine for facilitating this conversation. Thank you, Eric, for your comments. Moving to our next speaker, Jessica White is a research fellow in Rusi's Terrorism and Conflict Group. She has a background in counterterrorism through her experience in US military intelligence and is now completing a PhD looking at the challenges to effective gender mainstreaming in PVE. Jess will speak about some of the challenges to meaningful gender mainstreaming in counterterrorism work, linking them back to the findings of the prevention paper. Jess, over to you. Thanks, Sabine. So I'm just going to give a few findings from my PhD research on gender mainstreaming and PCVE. 
And I, I came to the conclusion at the end of my thesis that there are two significant gaps in most approaches. The first gap is focused on the donor end of the issue. I think there's a, a couple of ways to look at it conceptually. There's a gap between how donors define PCVE and how they try to design, implement, and evaluate programming. PCVE is often defined as a holistic preventative solution. Um, therefore, I, I argue that it needs to have a human security approach. It needs to consider every individual's insecurities, which would include gender inequality as a, as a, a cause of insecurity. Gender inequality should be seen as a driver of VE and treated it as such. Um, it's been shown that more equal societies uh, do lead to more sustainable societies. PCVE is often applied within a state security framework, which requires it then to meet programming to fulfill the same state security goals as hard CT measures do. This can lead to the securitization of gender issues and women's rights, as well as to other um, concerns about securitizing related programming, such as development or peace building programming. Uh, therefore, at the end, I argue that, that PCVE programming as a preventative solution needs to be shifted to this human security framework rather than the state security one. Practically, donors um, often, you know, use this definition of PCVE as a, as a holistic solution. However, as Emily said, they tend to only fund short programming cycles with minimal budgets. This demands that implementing organizations and, you know, non-governmental organizations and local community groups to stick to narrow definitions of programming so that they're able to prove success in a short time frame with a small budget. That often leads them to a focus on components which have outputs that are more easily measured so they can indicate their progress and continue to get their funding and um, appealing to the donors and the stakeholders on what they want. So this often doesn't allow enough time or attention to the processes of making meaningful changes to deeply ingrained social issues like gender inequality. A uh, second, I think the other major gap is with the understanding of, of gender and the definition of gender. Uh, often with a CVE programming, they, they use the term gender, but it ends up equaling women, which is not the case. It applies equally to all people. There are underlying social expectations of masculinities and femininities, which drive insecurity. Uh, the expectations of masculinity can often contribute to why men engage in violent extremism, as well as why women do. Understanding these social expectations could help CVE practitioners to understand the drivers of violent extremism as well as effective ways to prevent it. Therefore, I think I argue a gender sensitive approach needs to be taken and it needs to be applied across the whole of the program, not just to the component that might be about empowering women or or gender related components. There are other gender implications, even in components that may not appear on the surface to have anything to do with gender. For example, um, capacity building training for government security forces on PCVE, they may not be overtly gendered. However, gendered social roles can dictate who joins the security forces, who leads the security forces, or who contributes to or even gets to participate in those trainings. So there are gendered implications to something that isn't overtly about gender. Uh, components that do focus on the empowerment of women can be helpful, but are not enough to tip the balance of inequality. Um, Gathering gender data on the context of CV programs locations can show how inequality drives insecurity. And I argue that that would help to show the varied roles that social expectations of masculinity and femininity can play in the contexts uh, where CVE and preventing violent extremism programming is, is being implemented. Understanding those socially constructed contexts can also help to avoid gender essentialism, which is unfortunately somewhat common, I think, in the implementation of PCVE programming. There's often assumptions that women should be utilized as mothers or as peacemakers due to their nat natural inclinations in the communities um, and that men are inherently more violent. These are gender essentialisms, which we should try and avoid. Uh, CVE programming should be about tackling, I think, these and about balancing the issues of equality, not encouraging them. So those are the findings that um, my thesis came to and, and, and they relate back to several of the things that Emily had mentioned about the findings of the prevention paper. Thank you, Sabine. Thank you, Jessica, uh, for your comments. Uh, our final speaker for today is Dr. Elizabeth Pearson. Liz is a lecturer at the Cyber Threats Research Center, CyTrek, and an associate fellow at RUSI. Her PhD looked at how gender works within UK extremism. Liz is also a contributor to the volume New Directions in Women, Peace and Security, 
marking 20 years of the United Nations Security Resolution 1325. This publication will be out in July and available at Amazon. Liz will talk about the complexities and tensions of Muslim women's participation in PVE in the UK and the ways they use it to resist patriarchy and find agency. Thank you, Liz. Thanks very much, Sabine. Um, hi, everyone. I, I just really want to make two points um, today about ways in which I think women-centric PCVE can work from women's point of view. And the first relates to community and women's ownership of PCVE, and the second to affect, collective emotion, and the possibility of PCVE as a site of resistance. So in spite of the really important critiques around instrumentalization and securitization, this isn't just about women having strategies done to them. Women can use PCVE to exert agency and to contest both government and local patriarchy and potentially transform both. So I'm looking at what works based on accounts from Muslim women that I've spoken to since 2013, and they've been delivering and receiving interventions under PREVENT, the UK's counter radicalization strategy. There's a caveat here. I'm not making any universal claims. I'm not Muslim. And Muslim women, like all women, have all sorts of different views. So to the first point, which is on community and women's ownership. So PCVE, as we know, as a concept, is uh, it's about soft programming and it's predicated on this idea of community. And so it can only succeed when it's enabled through grassroots relationships. And at grassroots, women, despite all their reservations about government, described to me ways in which they felt local ownership of the programmes they were involved in. And that was because Prevent took place not just within, but through the communities that women themselves constituted. So this is an important point, I think, because Prevent is rightly critiqued as a policy, but it's also about practice. And as practitioners know, PCVE can work in far more positive ways for women than the many critiques actually suggest. And in practice, because prevents women leaders had often naturally emerged within communities, they straddled these kind of dual roles of state and community representation. They had an ambiguous identity and that enabled prevent to become, or at least to feel for some women, like it was authentically part of their communities. So women described how their participation grew through grassroots word of mouth. So school gate recommendations, for instance, and these were essentially all about trust. So one intervention provider told me prevent was actually the opposite of tick box programming, precisely because she believed and felt that it came organically from within communities, kind of paradoxically. So women were finding common scripts between community and between authority, and they were exploiting them and not just being exploited. Which brings me to the second point that I want to make, which is about affect, collective emotion, and PCVE as um, a space for resistance. So women told me that they could use participation in PREVENT to find new identities, to find new status, and new community positions. So even when they were often skeptical about government and prevents broader aims. So this is kind of linked to the state goal of women's empowerment, which has been very much critiqued, but it was kind of a form of empowerment that prevent didn't really anticipate. That happens in the experience of women sharing, women sharing stories, sharing emotions, things that they wouldn't otherwise express to authority figures. And that enabled them to subvert interventions and their outcomes. So prevent workshops were spaces where women could get angry away from them. They could carve out space to push back collectively. And this whole process was rooted in tensions. There was skepticism about prevent, but women were participating. And this tension framed how they participated. It became politicizing. They could raise matters such as parenting difficulties, lazy husbands, Islamophobia, issues with the far right, as well as counter radicalization. And they could raise them in ways that were potentially transformative. And that meant they could impact policy. And if you look at 2011, when Prevent was um, rebranded, it moved then to consider the far right. And in part, that was a result of feedback from Prevent groups, as well as wider communities. 
But women were also using Prevent to resist local patriarchy. So one woman told me she attended Prevent workshops because she was sick of men talking all the time locally without changing anything. And she sought out women only space that Prevent offered because she felt that how women networked was different. This was an opportunity for a very different dynamic on this subject. And one Prevent officer explicitly told me she used her role to assert Muslim female leadership at a local level. These are just a couple of anecdotal stories. And she wanted to use this space to push back against men in her community. Um, she said, you know, they were considered leaders simply by virtue of their penis. So using Prevent in this way, it was possible to show an alternative. To sum up, what I'm saying is that women's participation could constitute a transformation of policy, patriarchy and community. And it was slow and it was not linear, but it was there. So what women said worked was when they could assert their own agency and prevent when they could own it, even where they also criticized it. And in fact, the tensions between this macro level mistrust and the micro level trust within communities raised the possibility for something transformative. And I think what we need to do is, is evaluate whether what works for women based on what they say is also something that works in terms of strategies. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope uh, if you want to read more on this, that you will turn to, to the book, New Directions in Women, Peace and Security. Thanks for that mention, Sabine. And back to you. Thank you, Dr. Pearson. We now have some time for your questions. So I'd like to start with a question from Lord Alex Carlyle a distinguished fellow at RUSI. And Lord Carlyle asks, do you agree that there is limited, truly evidence-based qualitative research into the effectiveness of PVE projects and that many academics in the field start from a position of outright support or rejection of PVE projects? If this is the case, it makes life very difficult for honest policymakers. Does your work assist decision makers? And I'd like to um, actually you know, respond to that first and maybe um, Emily would want to uh, answer that question. And Lord Carlisle, I mean, you completely agree. I think you know, these issues around you know, preventing violent extremism or the role of civil society or the role of Muslim women um, and you know, British Muslim opinion, I think these are all very you know, complex and sensitive issues. And I think you know, if you look at, for example, the recent um, Crest uh, research that was published in March of this year, you know, they, they had a research project which was entitled Listening to British Muslims on Policing, Extremism and Prevent. And actually, I thought that their research was very insightful because it chimed with my own personal and professional experience, which is that, and I think I did try to highlight some of this at the beginning, where in my view, there tends to be a superficial characterization of British Muslim opinion. And there are limitations in the research in this field. And sometimes that research tends to reinforce the dominant polarizing narratives. And I think, again, if you look at what Crest had seen when they interviewed British Muslims and gave them a neutral explanation of the PREVENT program, 80% of British Muslims either offered qualified or unqualified support for the program. And again, to be very frank, they, you know, they did set out what their concerns were with the program. But when they heard that neutral explanation, they were broadly uh, supportive. And again, 66% of British Muslims said they would prefer concerns about someone they knew who was being radicalized to the PREVENT program. So I think for me, it does reiterate the, the kind of challenges that we have in the evidence base at the moment and the skill set that we need to be able to unpick some of these issues, segment different Muslim communities, and analyze these issues in a mature and holistic manner. Uh, Emily, would you want to add anything to that? Yes, thank you. Um, I think it's a really important question because you know, we constantly say, well, there aren't enough evaluations in this space to really know what's working. Um, and actually, you know, our research didn't disprove that. We, we still struggle to find independent evaluations, um, but I did find more pieces or more documentation out there than perhaps I had anticipated. Um, where we struggle or where the literature struggles is at um, assessing effectiveness at the outcome level. So there's some quite good pieces of research which will talk about outputs, so number of people who've been trained, uh, number of pieces of content distributed, um, and even I think probably look at things like 
positive outcomes related to participants who um, were included in a PCVE intervention activity. Um, but really to demonstrate impact, we need to go one step further. And that's one of the points I was making in a sense that we, we are overly critical, <clears throat> I think of organizations in this space um, that are trying to do some really good work uh, because we're expecting them to be able to demonstrate impact. And that's hard to do when we know that there are small amounts of money available to do this work. However, I don't think um, that means that we can't assess effectiveness. And one of the things we've really tried to do in this project is to include as much data as we could to be able to make some tentative, and I mean, I'll say tentative, um, conclusions about effectiveness. And that means that we didn't limit ourselves to independent evaluations or just peer reviewed material, for example, but we took into account organization and their reports um, so that we would be able to see what they felt was working. Um, so I don't think that we necessarily end up being, you know, overly critical, or I, I hope we don't, that really wasn't the atten intention. I mean, I myself went back through the paper and realized that, as you as you've rightly said in the question, Lord Carlisle, that um, the criticisms themselves didn't always provide evidence. And that included things that myself and sorry to throw Liz under a bus, but myself and Liz had written about that, you know, we came up with criticisms based on um, interviews we'd done with women, say, with the research we did in 2015 and 16, but that we hadn't actually specifically looked at um, a mother's based program, for example, we hadn't evaluated it. And so our own criticism was lacking the rigorous evidence that we've required of um, organizations working in this space. So I, I do think that there are some findings in there that will be useful to policymakers. And we haven't just tried um, to sort of end up in a positive or negative um, um, kind of position. We, we've really tried to see what the evidence says. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we have another question from Jane Huckabee. How do metrics for evaluating women-centric PVE relate to the general metrics for evaluating PVE? Should we be thinking of them differently? And Jess, do you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, I think um, part, part of my PhD was looking at sort of best practices that have been, you know, developed by RUSI and, and USAID and other organizations that are, are very involved in CDE and looking at, you know, what are the best ways to measure effectiveness of programming and what, you know, what should be the m and &E standards for these types of programs. And I looked at adding in a gender analysis framework, and I think that the key to that is that it is the gender sensitive perspective is applied across the whole program and not just the women centric um, pieces of programming that might occur, because I think that to take you need to take that the gender contextual issues into account for all of the programming components, as well as ones that might be women centric so I, I don't think it should be separate I think it should be included as a the gendered question should be included throughout the measurement and evaluation of the whole program and even the design and the implementation. You know when you're considering your theories of change and, and your frameworks for setting up your components, I think it needs to be included all throughout not just the women-centric pieces. Great, thank you, Jess. We now have a question from Yvian Lidig, who asks, what are the differences and similarities between women-centric PVE initiatives targeting Islamists and the far right? Is the latter still underdeveloped? Uh, Dr. Pearson, would you like to answer this question? Um, yeah, sure. I think it's a really interesting and important question because um, governments that have for quite a long time been thinking about jihadist and Islamist uh, extremism and now sort of slowly in a lot of countries, there are exceptions um, in Scandinavia and in Germany, they're now slowly thinking about the far right. And we have some countries which are more or less reluctant to consider the far right as a form of extremism um, at all. And I think what's really important is that we don't um, apply the same kind of uh, necessarily the same logics. And it has happened a little bit in the UK that the kind of one thing works well, there's a kind of assumption that you can simply transpose PCB interventions onto another ideology without having done the necessary gendered work to understand what is actually needed. And just the straightforward fact that um, 
within a Western context, um, there's a lot more overlap between far right ideologies and um, what one might call mainstream um, discourse is a, is a huge problem. And it means that the logic can't apply in the ways in which um, Islamist focus PCV can work. I mean, we do still need um, and to draw on the many decades of existing research around not just women, but gender and masculinities on the far right. It needs to be ingested into the policy responses. It needs to be better understood, better integrated. Sometimes things can be very siloed. And we need to understand that we can't always just be talking, which I think is the sort of trap about problem men and that um, particularly when you're thinking about um, something like gender equality as a kind of solution that's been applied to right, uh, rightly and wrongly in an Islamist context, you have a number of far right groups which are obviously um, focused on their own versions of gender equality. So there's no, there's no straightforward line between these two ideologies and they shouldn't even be the only two ideologies that PCV initiatives are obviously thinking of. We, we need to listen to what is already out there. And we need to make sure the same mistakes are not made in a different space. Great, thanks Liz for that. I've now got a question for Eric Rosen from Richard Chasdy and he asks, can you provide examples of some types of feel good PVE programs as you describe? Thanks Eric. Uh, sure, um, that's a good question. And I think uh, um, off the top of my head, I would just, highlight maybe three of them. Uh, one is uh, um, youth empowerment programs. Um, I think all of this uh, training or training of young people on how to develop counter narratives online. Um, I think it's, uh, again, uh, it, it sounds right, it feels right, um, but I'm not sure that uh, they're always targeting the most relevant young people. And, and I'm not sure that the development of counter narratives alone um, is addressing the uh, reasons why um, people in the community are becoming um, uh, radicalized. I think another area is the training of uh, religious leaders to promote moderate uh, interpretations of religion. Um, I think that again, feels good, is relatively easy to do with uh, um, governments in, for example, the Middle East and North Africa, who often the religious leaders are government, um, uh, are government officials, um, and it's a safe, safe act activity. So those would, those would be the sort of two examples that, that come to mind. I think one of the failings, if you will, of the, the White House CV summit um, was this over uh, emphasis placed on uh, counter narratives and um, over emphasis placed on the role of religious leaders. Um, and I think uh, if one had to do it all over again, you would have seen a, probably a very different emphasis placed uh, during that, um, that period of time on uh, particularly now that we have so much more information about on what, what the drivers are. But I think um, just one, one quick point, and this is about this, the, the focus on, 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 on the UK Prevent Program. I think it's in some ways, uh, you know, um, unfortunate that Prevent gets all the attention it gets because it's just, and it gets all the attention because it was the first, it's the biggest, um, there's the most been written about it, but it sort of um, dominates the airwaves and it uh, um, both dominates positively and negatively. And I think it prevents programs out of Canada, programs out of the, the Netherlands, programs out of uh, Scandinavian countries that are much more nuanced, much more bottom up from getting the attention uh, they deserve. and in terms of also replication around the world. And I think it, it is one of those things that uh, we still have to deal with, but I think prevent um, is not perfect. Uh, and it has a lot of criti criti uh, valuable um, justified criticisms, but it gets too much attention. And I think I would hope going forward that um, as we've seen this emergence of other programs around the world, um, not to the scale of prevent, that these programs will start getting much more attention and they're much more, um, they've learned the lessons of prevent from the early stages to prevent. And I think they're much more uh, filled of, of, of best practices that could be emulated uh, more so than prevent. Thanks, and, Thanks Eric. Um, we've now got a really interesting question maybe that Emily could answer from Musa, um, from Musa and uh, Burebaka. And they ask on the basis of your research, 
What are your policy recommendations so that women are truly included as active actors, as role models, credible voices of PVE strategies, and not only as mothers, sisters, and wives? And you know, these, uh, the question was related to yourself, Emily, and I think you know, people would welcome your views on that. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Sabine. Um, I think it's a really important question. Um, and, you know, one that I think we kind of struggle, struggle to answer. So I'll, I'll do my best here. Um, but the point is that there are, you know, there is a need, and I think Jess was talking about this, to ensure that women are engaged at all levels of security policy. You know, women, women should not be relegated to the domestic realm. I mean, work that I've done in overseas countries, um, which I actually will not name, um, but you know, the men in the room, the policy-making men in the room are very happy to talk about mothers' programs because they don't want to talk about including women in uh, discussions about national security or um, PVE national action plans. So, you know, the concern isn't necessarily that some of these programs um, which capitalize on women's valuable roles in families and communities um, are not important. I think in some contexts that, that, you know, they do seem to have a very valuable role, but that we shouldn't preference them over our broader initiatives to try and include women um, at you know, all levels of society, particularly I would say um, at the highest levels of policy making. And where I come to that, I, I do think that sometimes there are certain contexts where it is a lot harder to have these conversations. Um, you know, my, my own experience uh, is you know, the best part of a decade working in and on Afghanistan. And it is difficult to sometimes have conversations around women's roles in the public sphere. Um, in, in different communities. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep on trying. What it does mean is that some of those broader gender empowerment efforts need to be continued. And it might be, and I'm gonna put myself out there, it might be that it's not the right place to start talking about engaging women in PCVE initiatives when there are such broader structural challenges that exist in a country um, that, and that attention might um, be better uh, focused on those broader issues. Though I know that is not the fault of NGOs or civil society organizations, um, but is where I think some of the funding or at least some of the narrative around where the funding is lies. I hope that answers your question. Great, uh, thanks, Emily. I think I just also want to kind of add on from that in terms of some of the trends that we're seeing in relation to Muslim women being involved in PVE work in this country. I think that the kind of daily working environment has, has never been more difficult for civil society groups, especially for those that are operating on the front line. And I think some of them are questioning whether they should continue to do this work. I mean, as Emily has pointed, and as we all know, um, we know women who have been threatened and killed in countries like Afghanistan, in Pakistan and in Somalia. And it is worrying seeing some of the trends here where some Muslim women have been uh, experienced abuse, threats, intimidation, um, disinformation, smears to their reputation. And these are from Islamist extremists in the UK. And simply because these women are trying to deliver vital PVE work. So I think that there are, you know, I think this is an opportunity to have a more broader discussion about where civil society is and the kind of challenges that they're experiencing in delivering PVE work. Um, we have another great question from Anum Aftab. Maybe Emily, you want to take this, which is, thank you for your presentation. You mentioned that m and &E should be user friendly. Could you elaborate a little bit? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. Maybe if I can I potentially suggest Eric might have something to, to add after me. Um, but you know, one of the challenges I think we've we've had is that uh, when we look at evaluation in this space, we are trying to you know prove causation um, in a field where it's very difficult to say that your particular intervention has uh, impacted positively or negatively on violent extremism. We're we're trying to prove the negative as well. We're, we're trying to say you know it hasn't happened, therefore something we've done has worked, um, which is really counterintuitive. 
Um, but I think more specifically, the, the monitoring and evaluation techniques that are evolving, and there are some really good ones, I, I, I think, in the field, um, and it's definitely improved in the last few years, but they're very expensive and they're very technical. And it might be, you know, things looking um, at having control groups, which could be controversial in the field. So one of the things I think um, we need to look at is, well, what do we mean by evidence in this field? What do we mean by effectiveness? Uh, you know, it might mean that we're not going to be talking about impact on violent extremism per se, but that we can make a credible contribution story um, that our outcomes, the positive things that we've seen at the outcome level, so changes potentially in attitudes or behaviors or knowledge, um, that there's a credible relationship between those outcome chain level changes and potentially having an impact on violent extremism. But this is something that a number of us in the field are working on. Um, just a little plug for, for Hedaya, and there was a, a Massar monitoring evaluation app that uh, we helped um, Hedaya uh, develop uh, two years ago, I think now. Um, they are going to be reissuing that, um, and I think that will help uh, to establish some kind of baseline or, or kind of starting steps uh, as to how to do monitoring and evaluation in this field. Thanks, Sabine. Thanks, Emily. Um, and I'll just um, highlight the last question and because we're running out of time, but a, a very important question, which was, you know, how important is theology and ideology more widely in relation to both counter radicalization? Um, and I think this is a really important question. It's something that I personally could spend you know, the rest of the day talking about, but we are actually having a whole series of seminars looking at this. And we're intending to have another seminar which is looking at the role of religious interventions. And hopefully we can answer that question in detail um, at the next seminar. We are now coming close to three o'clock. So I'm going to draw the webinar to a close. And I'd like to highlight that the EU CT coordinator, Gilles de Cachot, has recently commented that the pandemic is fueling extremism on the far right and far left in Europe and giving Islamist terrorists in Iraq and Syria the cover to regain influence. I think even prior to COVID-19, we all recognize that many of the current challenges in relation to radicalization and terrorism are chronic and generational. For this very reason, the RUSI research is important in progressing the global debate on preventing violent extremism. Moving forward, we would welcome your views. Through an open, inclusive and transparent process, I have no doubt our collective expertise can advance global knowledge and policy approaches towards these issues. And this will ultimately contribute to how we collectively maintain the national security of our respective countries and citizens. It's coming up to three o'clock, so it just remains for me to thank our panel, Emily Winterbotham, Eric Rosen, Jessica White and Dr. Elizabeth Pearson. I'd also like to thank you, our audience at home for joining this webinar. Thank you for your questions. And I'm sorry that we couldn't get through all of those questions, but we will look through them and intend to get back to you, addressing them point by point. We also hope that the 11, mon 11 monthly seminar series that we will be convening over the course of the year will give you an opportunity to be able to look at these issues in more forensic detail because that will be the focus of the series which is looking at exploring the evidence base for PVE. So on behalf of Rusi in Whitehall in London, thank you, keep safe and goodbye. <laughs>